There is a growing minimalist movement taking shape. People embracing a simpler way of life. They're purging possessions, freeing their lives from excessive obligations to untap greater possibilities. But I've already said too much. I'm Mike Walter in Los Angeles. Let's take it full frame. <laughs> Ever wonder if there's any truth to the old adage that less is more? Well, the growing minimalist movement is proving that less can be more, much more. And no one knows that better than our first guest this week, Joshua Becker, inadvertently found a new vocation after realizing that his possessions were preventing him from fully realizing his purpose. A somewhat accidental blogger, he could hardly imagine that his musings about becoming a minimalist would eventually garner 2.2 million page views monthly. Joshua Becker is a minimalist, an author, a husband, and a father. He's also someone who gave away about 70% of his family's possessions. So what happened next? Well, he found freedom, more money, and more time. He believes that simplicity is an invitation to a better way of life. He'll tell you intentionally living with less allows you to have a richer, more meaningful life experience. He's author of Living With Less, An Unexpected Key to Happiness, and he also penned the Amazon number one bestseller, Clutter Free With Kids. Joshua is here to share how having less, less stuff, can actually lead us all to greater gratification. Welcome to the broadcast. Thanks for coming in. Yeah, pleasure to be here. I love talking about this. Well, I'll try and be a minimalist in my questions. <laughs> uh, what is it, minimalism? Uh, minimalism, I think, on the surface is about owning less stuff. It's about owning fewer possessions. It's about finding that there's more joy in owning less than we can find in pursuing more. Uh, it's a, a movement that you see growing across all spectrums of society, young 20-somethings who want to be mobile and travel. You find it family men you're just looking for a new way of life, um, entrepreneurs and startups, uh, retirees selling their homes so they can move around the travel around the country. So I think everyone comes in with a different goal in mind, but ultimately we've all become convinced that our possessions are much more of a burden than we ever realized. But... Uh, it, I would think that it's minimal how many minimalists that there are compared to all of us who are just, I got to get this, I got to, we're all accumulators. How do we get to be the way we are? I mean, it's so much consumerism out there. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. It's a, uh, it's a growing movement, but uh, certainly still a minimal one, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, means I still have a job, I guess. So. <laughs> No, you know, I think there's a lot of reasons. Obviously, the, um, the, the world that we live in, we see 5,000 advertisements a day. Every single one tells us that we'll be happier if we buy more, that our life isn't as good as it could be until we buy whatever it is that, that they're selling. Uh, there's the little, you know, some scientific study on shopping and the, the little pleasure hit that we get from it and the little dopamine burst that, you know, uh, drains pretty quickly. So, marketers, shopping, I, I think there's a... Um, obviously consumer-driven society that we grow in, and then I'll, th I'll think that kind of feeds into our, I don't know, like our little selfish greed and pride and ego, and I think all those things play together, and it, you know, just creates this world that we live in. Keeping up with the Joneses. Yeah. I mean, that's a big part of it, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, God, they've got that. I've got to have it. But it doesn't bring pleasure to them or to us, <laughs> and yet we think it does. Yeah, I think we're just told so many times, right? That's, that's just the message. That we'll, we think we're going to be happier if we have more. Once we reach this income level or once we buy this house in this neighborhood or drive this car or have this style of clothing, that once we, once we reach that, once we acquire that, then, then we're going to be happy. And you know what? We get there and we find out that, that we're not. So we seek more, unfortunately. Tell me about when the light bulb goes off. Uh, because at some point you have to sit there and you have to say, Wait a minute. So tell me about that experience for you. When did you have your epiphany? What caused it to happen? Yeah, I was doing the most mundane of things. I was cleaning my garage. It was, <laughs> it was a Saturday morning, and so we were doing what most Americans do on the weekend. We were cleaning the house, right, running some errands, doing some shopping. I had uh, pulled everything out of my garage. My son was five years old at the time, and I had this dream that he would help me with the garage. But as soon as he <laughs> found his toys, he was in the backyard, of course, asking me to play with him. And I kept pushing him off, pushing him off, and I just found that hours later, I'm still working on this garage. And 
I happened to cross a uh, pass pass with my neighbor uh, who makes this comment about, isn't it great owning a home, right? She'd been spent all day working on her home. And uh, eventually she says this, she says, you know, that's why my daughter is a minimalist. She keeps telling me I don't need to own all this stuff. And I just remember looking at the pile of dirty, dusty things piled up in my driveway that I'd spent all morning cleaning and noticing my five-year-old son alone in the backyard and just the juxtaposition that not only were my possessions not making me happy, but they were actually distracting me from the very thing that did bring me happiness and fulfillment and purpose and joy. And there's a very different realization and that, that led to this decision to get rid of the stuff we don't need and, and uh, start living differently. Let me ask you this, because I don't want to be the devil's advocate, but I'm going to be. Yeah. Uh, I think about you arriving at this decision and that there are probably a lot of people like you but then the spouse doesn't necessarily arrive at that decision. There's minimalism where you go off and you're kind of separate or whatever, you know, you get divorce or whatever, because I think it's, it's got to be a mutual thing. I mean, did your wife say, oh, this is fantastic, or was there some pushback? Or I mean, it's a great idea if it's her getting rid of all of her junk, but when, they, <laughs> when it's, wait a minute, I'm not getting rid of my pool table or whatever, right? I mean, isn't that an issue? Yeah, I mean, it's the number one issue. I mean, the biggest question that I hear over and over again, what do I do about my spouse? What do I do about my partner? And it's, it's always tough to know exactly where that's, where that's coming from. Um, I know full well that, that my wife puts up with a lot of things that she doesn't like about me, you know? And so, so there's always grace and patience, I think, that we have to show to our partners and, and to our spouses. But she she was in, I mean, she had been spring cleaning the inside of the house all morning, so I think she had the realization as well that, that we owned too much. Uh, if I wanted to get rid of 80%, she wanted to get rid of 60%. And so the first little bit went pretty well, and then I kept wanting to get rid of more and she starts pushing back and so you know just like any relationship we learn we learn compromise uh, i've come to realize it's much easier to see everyone else's clutter than it is to see our own so i can focus on my stuff we can look for common areas can we all agree there's too many pieces of Tupperware in this cupboard. Can <laughs> I get rid of some? And uh, you do the best, just like in any relationship. All the Tupperware, I can always find the bottom. I can't find those <laughs> yeah, exactly. lids. That's why I want, them all, I want it all gone. So uh, when did you first realize that it was going to impact your life in a good way? Because I think your assumption is that this is going to be a good thing, but you're not really never sure. I mean, are you? Very early on in the process, uh, it legitimately was, we started writing, uh, we started the, the blog that night, just uh, more or less to keep my mom up to date on what we were doing. Um, but, uh, but very early on, one of the, the things as, as you write and as you journal, you're, you're forced to think intentionally about what's happening and about what you're noticing. And like very early on, we started recognizing some of these benefits of, of owning less stuff. I mean, less cleaning at the, at the very beginning. We had more money, there was less distraction. We had more time on it. I mean, you just think of how much time we spend cleaning and organizing and maintaining and repairing and replacing, like just all that time that we spend. So we, uh, we saw it pretty early on and um, I think it propelled us forward. It motivated us forward to get rid of more stuff and go through more rooms and push even further. It's easier to find stuff when there's less stuff, right? It's I mean, easier to find stuff. You can find the keys in the wallet, right? <laughs> find your so umbrella. talk to me about kids though, because uh, you know we, we talked about the spouse. Kids, uh, they may not play with the stuff, but they don't want to get rid of it, do they? Yeah. Um, well, it depends on the personality. I uh, found that our, our son did much better with this than, than our daughter did. Um, but yeah, kids are very, I mean, there's a, a study out of Great Britain that came out. Um, the average British child has 238 toys and plays with 12. Uh, I was in Stockholm not that long ago and they were citing pretty similar statistics. Certainly America, you know, the numbers look, look very similar. And it's very interesting because the, like I mentioned the book Clutter Free with Kids, like it, it was the number one book on parenting for like two or three weeks in America and Canada. Like I told people I was writing a book called Clutter Free with Kids and parents couldn't wait for it. <laughs> Tell me when it's gonna be done because we all know that our kids have too much stuff and it drives us crazy. But I don't think we realize that it's usually the parents that are the problem, right? And I try to remind them, your kid's not run to the department store to buy the things. They don't have the income. Like They have the stuff that you have bought for them. And if you don't learn boundaries, right? I think I've come to find that the kids don't 
kids who don't learn boundaries become adults who don't define them. And so I, I've found a lot of joy in telling my kids, you know, this is how much space you have. Your toys can fit here. We're not going to go buy that because we don't have the money. We're using it for something else. And helping kids realize that so that they know that life isn't about infinite resources, but it's about making decisions and making priorities. It's funny, though. I mean, like, if you think back, like, uh, Christmas Day, all these parents who get, like, 30, 40 gifts for their kids, and then the kid's playing with the wrapping paper at the end of the day. You know, they, all this stuff's been pushed aside. Let me ask you this about minimalism. Um, is there a requirement? Is there, like, if I wanted to join your movement, do I, like, can I still hold on to the, the big screen TV? I mean, what's the limit on what should you get rid of? What, what, I mean, when do you get to join the club, I guess? Yeah, I think the benefit is that there's no one setting the, setting the rules for the club. There, there's minimal, there, there's there's no, minimal rules, right? There's no line <laughs> about what you can join. Dave Bruno wrote a book called 100 Big Challenge years ago. Um, it was on Newsweek and Time. Like, major media picked it up. And he tried to live with 100 things. And uh, for a while, that kind of became this arbitrary number that, oh, if you own 100 things and you're a minimalist. And I, I think mostly people don't. You know, they see value in the experiment. In the experiment, they see value in in trying to own less. But uh, ultimately, it's about defining what what you want your life to be about. Like, what is your purpose going to be in life? What do I need to keep? What tools do I need in order to accomplish that? And then, what's what's distracting me from it? And so, when I when I define minimalism, I I say minimalism is the intentional promotion of the things we most value and the removal of anything that distracts us from it. And that looks different from person to person and family to family, and I think that's okay, and I think that's great, and I think there's, there's freedom in it, and just uh, kind of pushing for less rather than always driving for more. What about the blog? Were you surprised that, uh, you know, we were throwing out the statistics there? I mean, you've done well with the books, obviously, but, uh, but the blog, I mean, people were, it, it, were you surprised that you were tapping into something there? Yeah, very much, very much. It, it, it was just a diary at first, just a journal. I think two people are reading it, me and my mom. I don't think my wife was reading it at the time. <laughs> but it continued to grow, and we started to realize that, that this could be more than just about us, but this could actually be a place to inspire others, to invite others to find the, the joy that, that we found in, in owning less. And I, I think there's a lot of reasons to it. Last one, one million people read it last, last month, and as we were talking earlier, um, Stockholm and Orlando and Las Vegas and here today and uh, Charlotte next, next couple weeks. Like, this is a message that's, that's growing, and I think technology makes it possible. I think um, sustainability and environmentalism is a, you know, contributes to it. The, um, the millennial generation is probably more minimalist than any generation prior, the global recession. I think there's a lot of factors that, that play into this, probably the most being that we just own too much stuff. The average, the average home has tripled, average American home has tripled in size in the last 50 years. Jeez. And still one out of 10 Americans rent off-site storage. And even more of those complain that their houses are too small, right? Like, <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I know somebody who has three storage units. I mean, they, they grow those. I mean, it's ridiculous, but, but people do it. So what, are, what, what kind of feedback do you get? I mean, I know you have speaking engagements, and you obviously, with the blog, there's a lot of interaction back and forth. I mean, what do you hear from people? Do you hear some people, I want to do it, but I'm just not so sure? Or what? Uh, I, I think that you find a, a lot of people who are who are drawn to it but don't necessarily know how to how to get started. Um, I, I actually receive very few people who tell me that I'm wrong. Uh, like maybe on one hand, I can count the number of people who said that, that I'm wrong about this. I think most people, when you when you kind of strip away some of the negative assumptions about a certain number and that it's boring and stark and start speaking about, no, no, it's not about just removal of possessions. It's about adding in the, the bitter, bigger and better things into our lives, that, that people are generally drawn to it. Um, and then I think they appreciate the, the freedom, like the newfound freedom that, that they find. it. I had an email one time, um, it was from a lady. Uh, she said her and her husband both worked uh, two jobs. They both worked jobs. They were at home um, doing the dishes one evening, and they overheard their eight-year-old son comment to his friend, and the, his friend said, yeah, we don't see our parents a lot. They, they work a lot. And like it just cut like a knife, just the realization they worked so hard to buy this big house and the nice clothes and the fancy car. And they're like, but what am I sacrificing as a part of it? And so just new freedom to find 
new values, to find new purpose, to find different things to, to pursue. Somebody watching this broadcast, they're close, they want to jump, what would you say to them? Yeah, start easy, start simple. We get so wrapped up in the, the hard things, the my book collection or the sentimental stuff or my yarn stash in the craft room. Like we always run to the hardest things to, to get rid of. And I say, just start simple. Like we started in my, in my car, just pulling out everything in my car that didn't, didn't need to be there. Just, you know, go in your closet and pull out the clothes that don't need to be there. Uh, get some of the decorations that were just on clearance and don't really mean anything to you. The, the kitchen cupboard that's overflowing and the drawer. Just like, just get some of that stuff out of your way for a moment and just start to feel this, this presence of, peace and calm and, and um, newfound freedom. And then and then I'll help you when you get to the harder things down the line. <laughs> you sold me. I'm ready. <laughs> Thanks so much. Great to see you. Yeah, thank you. Coming up next, a conversation with two minimalism pioneers.